Gunfire and tanks, teenage girls detained in psychiatric wards, internet blocked, and yet, from the outside, it seems, Iran's nationwide protests are gaining momentum. This one month after the death of 22-year-old Marsa Amini at the hands of the morality police, these images were sent uh, Wednesday from the northern city of Rasht, that's near the Caspian Sea. What next? In a nation with no independent opposition or trade unions will measure the resilience of a leaderless movement and of a theocracy whose values are law of the land. The restrictions imposed by the government mirror restrictions from abroad. We'll be asking about the impact of sanctions on a youthful nation of 83 million, a nation where, until now, social and political movements have rarely coalesced into one in quite this way. Is it different this time? Today in the France 24 debate, we're marking one month since the start of Iran's uprising. And joining us from Tehran, he's been covering it for us. France 24 correspondent Reza Saye. How are you? I'm doing well, Francois. Thank you. From New York, Marsa Ali Madani, senior researcher at the human rights group Article 19. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. From Los Angeles, human rights attorney Gisu Nia. She heads the strategic litigation project at the Atlantic Council think tank. Welcome to the show. Thank you. She trained as a classical violinist and singer, exiled musician Aida Nusrat has been living in uh, Paris since 2016. You just dropped a song. We'll hear a clip from it uh, uh, in a little bit. Thank yes. you for, for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much for having the, me. The uh, France 24 debate where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. <laughs> Students shouting, bastards, bastards, at security forces outside a closed gate of Tehran University this Thursday, an officer seen pointing his gun uh, in this amateur video that was uploaded one month after the, the arrest of Marsa Amini, who would later be killed at the hands of the morality police. Vadika Behel looks at a movement that's as big as it was unexpected. Frozen at only 22, she's the face of the mass protests that have rocked Iran. Marsa Amini, whose death in police custody on September 16th erupted an unprecedented wave of rage. Three days before her death, Amini, a young Kurdish woman, was arrested in Tehran for wearing inappropriate clothing, or as it was deemed by the morality police who arrested her, because her hijab wasn't covering her hair. What happens next is vague. According to the authorities, Amini died in hospital after her fragile health led her into a coma. They even went as far as to broadcast these images, where a young woman is seen collapsing, as well as broadcast footage of her supposed hospital transfer, where they say she died. Apparently, she had a history of illnesses, which is indicated in the report. She underwent a brain operation at five years old. Scores of people took to the streets across the country demanding accountability, saying it was clear she was beaten to death, especially as the morality police have been accused of human rights abusers. The next day, thousands attended her funeral in her hometown of Sakez in Kurdistan, and it's here that the movement intensified with a very risky gesture. Over the next few days, that gesture went viral. Iranian women removing their hijabs in the street and even burning them. Despite the government cutting the country's internet connection, many videos continue to come out of Iran. Students and academics both got involved in the movement, with men also joining in to denounce the suppression of women. Look at the streets. The people protesting alongside the women are men. Next to every woman, there's a man who fights back. Since the initial anger, barely a day has gone by without a demonstration in Iran, with the movement spreading to cities across the country and even the region. Iran's government has cracked down in the streets with force as the numbers of wounded, arrested and even dead mount. But nothing has stopped the defiance of Iranian women, and another wave of resistance went viral, this time cutting their hair. On October 3rd, the country's supreme leader spoke for the second time since the protest began, but this time dismissed the demonstrations. 
I say clearly that these riots and their insecurity were engineered by the United States and the occupying false Zionist regime. Israel, as well as their paid agents, with the help of some traitorous Iranians abroad. This Sunday, the state-run news channel was hacked by digital activists supporting the protests, calling for Hamenei's exit. Reza Saieh, uh, is it possible with those uh, curbs to the internet to get a bit of a snapshot of what the situation's been like this Thursday? Uh, only uh, the snapshot, uh, as, as always, uh, Francois. Again, uh, I always remind our viewers that it's it's so difficult to do journalism uh, here in Iran because of the restrictions that we're facing, because of the lack of access uh, to, to different neighborhoods in Tehran, let alone all cities um, uh, in Iran. Uh, this Thursday was relatively quiet. Yesterday, on Wednesday, there was a lot of anticipation that there would be a spike in protests. There was a lot of chatter the day earlier that this would uh, happen. And indeed, there was seemingly an increase in anti-government demonstrations here in the capital in several uh, major cities. Uh, in, uh, we report this, as always, based on secondhand accounts and videos we saw uh, posted on social media. And those videos, uh, again, showed very brave, valiant Iranians, many of them women, uh, taking to the, the streets. You know, most of these videos, you examine them, uh, the, the numbers aren't that uh, big, maybe 20s and 30s. There were uh, others that were in, in the hundreds. Uh, and then you see there's the security forces and their menacing motorcycle gangs riding around in tandem with clubs um, and uh, what appeared to be uh, pellet guns and, and paint guns and sometimes what appear to be shotguns. And the demonstrations take this, uh, you know, form where you have these groups of protesters and these demonstrations flare up with these uh, anti-government slogans and, and these gangs of security forces uh, do what they can uh, to disperse them. Uh, that's what you see most of the time. In the Kurdistan region, it, it's a little bit more uh, intense. Uh, you, you see in these videos what sound... Uh, like gunfire. Uh, so that's that's what happened yesterday. Today was relatively quiet, but these developments show that despite the odds being against these protesters, they're doing what they can to sustain them. Uh, and the government is still struggling uh, to con contain them. And so there's a lot of uncertainty uh, where this is all going to head. Uh, Marsa Ali Mardani, you were with us two weeks ago. A lot has happened since. And uh, uh, we saw at one point those thinking perhaps this would start to wane a little bit. Uh, there weren't the big demonstrations that we saw at the beginning. And then the movement seemed, tell me if I'm wrong, to get a second wind. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a second win. I would uh, characterize it as a continuation of a movement and a continuation of very palpable anger throughout the country. Um, and, you know, it's it's great that we have Reza's perspective from North Tehran, or uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wherever he's based. Um, but I think it's um, really hard not to talk about what's happening without talking about the crimes. And I'm so glad we have another human rights expert on this panel today to really talk about um, the struggles we're getting with the internet disruptions to understand the scale of the crimes that are occurring. So human rights groups have, you know, estimated somewhere around 200 deaths, um, and this is, uh, you know, expected to be a far uh, smaller number than what is the reality because, you know, um, if you might call it the second wind, but uh, we've seen an increase in uh, the need to protest in places like Sistan and Baluchistan and Kurdistan, which, you know, are historically very 
oppressed and underprivileged regions of Iran. Um, and so we have been seeing um, small trickles of documentation coming out of these areas because there have been near total internet shutdowns in these provinces. And we cannot even begin to understand the scale of crimes and deaths perpetrated in these areas, especially Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, in San Andaj, we heard um, we were getting reports um, through the pockets of internet connectivity um, that the crimes are very high. There's enormous amount of pressure on, um, you know, protesters who have been wounded or who have been killed by their families, by themselves, not to report this. Um, and there has been, you know, the very intense increase of crackdowns that we are seeing online that has meant that we we get so little information out of Kurdistan and Sistan and Baluchistan is coinciding with very severe repression on the ground, which is something that I personally follow. It's when we see issues with internet connectivity, we are seeing on the ground repression very in very severe forms. Uh, let me ask you about this, Marcel, because Wednesday, and we can show a map of it, there were protests nationwide. Mo the, this is one map done by one monitoring group of uh, where protests happened uh, uh, in major uh, flashpoints uh, uh, across the country. And there, there are probably more where it happened. Uh, this is probably an incomplete estimate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, despite the images of tanks rolling towards Marsa Amini's native Kurdish region in the northwest, the defiance, again, continuing. Take a listen. This amateur footage is from uh, uh, the Kurdish city of Bukhan in uh, western Azerbaijan province. Uh, the burning of a national flag, the chanting of woman, life, freedom, which has been uh, the, the, the mantra uh, of this movement. Uh, there is this calculus, is there not, Marsa Ali Mardani, uh, that uh, if the regime can bait uh, minorities like the Kurds, like you mentioned in uh, Sistan, Baluchistan, then it can turn them turn this into something else. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Uh, turn this into something else. Of course, you know the discourse does uh, exist. Well, to blame that, it to, you know, to blame it on separatists Kurdish. and to to blame it on separatists and say, oh, this is about uh, regional demands. Well, you know, this is obviously propaganda and disinformation and, you know, the image of um, Kurd the Kurdish demographic in Iran as, uh, you know, a violent population is a misconception that has been promoted by the state. And so it should not take away from the fact that these are people in these regions, these are protesters with legitimate, legitimate demands for human rights. Um, and they have been, you know, feeling the brunt of human rights repression within Iran. Um, and so uh, we should not let these state narratives distract from the fact that we are seeing legitimate demands, we are seeing legitimate protests, and we are seeing a stifling of the right to protest. And so far, they haven't risen to the bait, it seems. Why is that? Um, risen to the bait? Sorry, I don't understand the question. I mean, turning it into a, 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 a Kurdish separatist movement, for instance, or, a, or, or, or making it about the rights of minority Sunnis in the southeast of the country. Well, this is about the the rights of everyone. So, you know, the rights of minority groups are the same as the rights of, you know, ethnic uh, Persian groups. So I, I believe that there is a continuum, at least what we are seeing being documented, what we are hearing from people on the ground. It is very much the same demand for human rights and equality systematically within the laws um, and within, you know, the systems of governance in Iran. Um, so it is a, you know, ultimately at the core of it, it's a call for human rights. Meanwhile, though, uh, we're seeing uh, other images uh, surfacing on social media of the morality police back on the streets of uh, Tehran. Uh, this according to this footage that was posted to Twitter.
You know, that reminds us, Gisunia, that at the uh, outset of it all, the spark was this morality police. Yeah, um, <clears throat> exactly. But, you know, I think that what the calls are in these protests are much broader than simply um, doing away with the morality police. It's really about this core of a legal discriminatory framework that does affect a lot of different groups, not only women. There is a strong gender discriminatory legal framework, but there's also a discriminatory legal framework against ethnic and religious minorities, LGBTQ populations. So these protests, I believe, are really about social change. They're about people wanting to live as they please, socialize as they please, dress as they please, and also have the rights that they're guaranteed under international conventions that the Islamic Republic of Iran is actually a signatory to, but that they do not abide by. And we saw last weekend, for instance, uh, there was a uh... Uh, booing outside of uh, a university hall where the country's president was speaking. And the booing was by uh, what is traditionally cons a conservative constituency, uh, these young women at that university. Yeah, and I think that's uh, what we're seeing. And that's why the Islamic Republic uh, leadership is quite concerned, because you know, the people that they maybe had envisioned as their foot soldiers are very disenchanted with um, the status quo. Uh, to go back to the Kurdish populations in Iran, since we were talking about that earlier, um, the Kurdish populations were actually in favor of the revolution back in 1979. So that might be, you know, a sort of overlooked detail. Um, they were very much in favor of it, and they wished for you know, a bit more rights in the new system. Clearly, that never materialized. And that's why you see that sort of widespread discontent. So this disinfo about, you know, every Kurd being a separatist or something like this is not its not really accurate. It's just that they've been marginalized historically. Um, but we're seeing that a lot of the people that the revolution was intended for, supposedly, um, are very disenchanted. And that's because they see the hypocrisy. They see that the leadership of the Islamic Republic peach, preaches piety, um, preaches simplicity and equality, but then their own children live, work, study, and visit North America and Europe have very flashy and lavish lifestyles, and that's been um, that's been documented on social media accounts and is readily accessible to anybody who can look at that online. So that's really what this is about. Yeah, right now uh, we're in a situation where uh, the the movement uh, has shown no sign of weakening. This past week, uh, Ida Nosrat, uh, you released. A new song. It's called Daughters of Cyprus. In the excerpt of the video that uh, we're about to see, there's images of uh, Nika Shakarami. That's the 16 year old protester uh, who died in custody and became uh, one of those uh, figures that's uh, been a symbol of this movement. <laughs> I don't know, Sarah, tell us about that song, first of all. Uh, okay, the history of this song, actually, this song, uh, in the caption, I, I mentioned it, in the caption of my post on Instagram, it, it belongs to 95 years ago. 1927. And, yes. And uh, the first uh, woman who, the singer woman who, who sang this, uh, she was like, um, really like a revolutionary woman, rebellion uh, singer at, at, her, at her time, Ramar uh, al Waziri. And uh, yeah, the, the author and also the composer of this song, they uh, wanted to their name remain hidden because of the uh, you know the um, problems that they the uh, religious people could uh, could make for them. Uh, 
but the lyric of this song, I I, re I recognize. I mean, um, kind of uh, find this um, song because I had no idea this song um, is existed, like several years ago. And then I was like in shock that wow, this this lyric is is like in a way that exactly it's um, for for nowadays of Iran. So I started to rearrange this uh, song uh, one and a half month ago, even before uh, this, all these movements happened in Iran, before Mahsa Amini got killed by, uh, by the government. And then, uh, then th these, all this happens, and then I was like, uh, it, it wasn't coincidence for me. It was like the sign that I, have to, I had to like, make a video clip on it and release it for, for people, for young generation, first of all. Uh, to to realize about their history that this this movement started 95 years ago even before of that but 95 five years ago the women started to um, say no to hijab to hijab like to um, operation hijab so it's like uh, um, yeah for me it was very important well, the, the country is broken the country is sleeping. That's is that's not is that the case today? The country is not sleeping, is it anymore? Yeah, no, no, no. It's not. It's, it, at that time, it was very sleeping. At that time, but now it's like people rise up. So it's like uh, you left Iran in 2016. Is that yes? At the end of 2016. And you left uh, trained as a classical violinist, but also uh, uh, lots of other instruments, including singing, singing solo for a woman in Iran today in 2022. It's still illegal. Um, yes, unfortunately, still is Ill illegal. Uh, it they can women can sing with a company of men or in a choir, but as a soloist, no. Why? Why there are other, uh, the, the reason is super conservative super, uh, states uh, in the in the Muslim world where that's that's not a prerequisite. Yeah, but the the reason is super humiliating for men and women both. Actually, uh, it's a similar reason that they, they enforce hijab, uh, that men, um, they, con they cannot control themselves when they, s they uh, hear a woman voice, like uh, as a solo woman voice. Uh, so it's like uh, rise up their desire or so, things like this. So it's like, it's super humiliating, like uh, dropping uh, human beings as, as women and men to the uh, to the animal <laughs> level, so it's like uh, I don't I never understood this. Uh, this you, you heard Gisunia talking about the Iranian Revolution, 1979, yes. and uh, okay, that was 1979. Why is that still the case today, though? Um, I don't know. I think, um, in my opinion, is like. Uh, Iranian people, they, maybe we needed this time to, this, this period of time to realize, uh, because they realize what, what was the, what's the real face of uh, actually religious people, like radical re religious people like uh, ayatollahs and mullahs, you know, is uh, because they were very holy, considered like really holy people. People had super huge respect to them. And... Uh, they were the, they are the most uh, great hypocrites on the planet doesn't matter in which religion they are all the same in my in my eyes so i think uh, i think iranian people the, i always i was thinking with myself that these 43 years of um, religious dictatorship what's the bright side for it and the only thing that i see is that the bright side that people realize People see the the roots of the, the the smelling roots of these people, and they 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 the reality, you know, these mullahs and uh, ayatollahs. So they don't they don't trust them anymore. This is the bright side of it, I guess. I guess. Marcia Lamidani, there's been other movements uh, in Iran, uh, women's movements uh, in the past, 2005, 2006, for instance. Uh, this time, though, with those. Um, High school students uh, who have been front and center, it's different. Uh, this, this realization, your reaction when you hear Ida Nosrat describe uh, how it's taken time to come to this point. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about 
what kind of generational shift we're seeing. As someone who focuses on technology, the generational shift is palpable for what's happening because we're seeing an extremely online set of protesters. Um, and, um, and it's if you dig deep into understanding this generation, you know, they're the children of, you know, millennials or older millennials. And millennials, so we're now three, four generations um, gone from the revolution, from the tra trauma of, you know, the massacres that happened um, at the hands of the state after the revolution, the eight years of war between Iran and Iraq. And so there is, you know, a little distance from that trauma and pain that kind of settled into in settled the population into the complacency mm. and the desire not to rock the boat. And so we have a generation who has not necessarily seen that pain or trauma and is just faced with lack of hope, lack of opportunities. And so it really seems that this generation has galvanized and has this desire that we haven't seen uh, previously. So that is really, I think, the essence of what is different um, and what really characterizes this. Uh, Reza Sai, it seems as though it's like three generations. There's uh, the generation that uh, was there during uh, the revolution of 1979, the generation that uh, remembers 2009 and the Green Movement, and the one you just heard described uh, by Marsa Alamardani, and uh, they don't have the same attitude. They don't, and if you want to separate and divide generations, you can keep dividing because there's three generations here in Iran that have stayed in Iran that are very different from the generations that have left uh, Iran and have a totally different view of what's happening here. But I think if you, you know, if you observe all of them and we hear it tonight, uh, Iranians, whether inside Iran or outside Iran, they love their country. They're passionate about their, their country. Many people, including my family, who left Iran still have scars from what happened in 1979. Many people lost their country, lost their loved ones, lost dreams about the future of, of Iran. And, and oftentimes, uh, you know, unfortunately, I see these dreams for what Iran should be clash with what reality here is on the ground. Uh, uh, this government has, do, has earned the right to be vilified. It is a repressive government. It is oftentimes a murderous uh, government. And we heard this government be vilified tonight. Again, in many ways, they earned the right to be vilified, but the question what now? How do you resolve this situation? How do you genuinely help the brave women who are fighting for basic rights, the men and women who want better lives? Do you do it with sanctions? Do you do it with continuing to vilify and apply pressure? If so, if that's the strategy, what's the end point? Do you give diplomacy a shot? We saw in 2015, it was a diplomatic achievement, according to many observers, that this nuclear deal was signed. And, you know, I said it a couple of weeks ago, you saw millions of people celebrate. Even then, the morality police was here, the mandatory hijab law was here, and these same people were optimistic. Um, obviously, things have changed over the past seven years, but there's so many questions about where things are, how we got here, and how we want to move forward. Uh, Gisunia, they're, they're talking about uh, uh, fresh sanctions uh, uh, against uh, Iran at this particular point. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, are sanctions going to work? I mean, this is a country that's under severe sanctions already, much more severe than Russia, for instance. I think we need to make a distinction with what types of sanctions. So there's broad-based economic sanctions, which often result in collective punishment for a people, and which, in my view, can be very ineffective in terms of sort of surgically um, targeting individuals that are causing the repression. But I think the discussion around sanctions is probably 
targeted human rights sanctions on individuals who are responsible for shutting the internet down, who are responsible for these crackdown, violent crackdowns that we're seeing on protesters, and who as of yet have not been um, designated under any authorities. A lot of people may question, you know, what is the benefit of that? How does that help? Well, I'll tell you that in um, asset tracing work that I'm involved in, a lot of these uh, individuals who are in the Islamic Republic leadership and their children have assets. They have offshore assets in North America and Europe. I was very surprised to discover the extent to which they have holdings. Um, they should not be able to uh, store their assets offshore where it's far from the effects of inflation and the other things that are actually affecting the people of Iran. And so I think- any Why, why didn't that happen? Why didn't, sorry to interrupt. Why didn't that happen when you had this hawkish uh, Trump administration? Well, when I'm talking about targeted sanctions, it's not only the U.S. government. So I think we need to make sure that we're not only focused on the U.S., as a lot of these discussions tend, tend to be. Um, there's the U.S., there's Canada, there's the EU, there's the U.K. There are other jurisdictions as well, um, you know, Japan, South Korea, and so on. But um, the reason that that didn't happen is because there's often not a focus on human rights. So a lot of individuals might get sanctioned for a number of other activities, whether it involves the nuclear program or ballistic missiles program, but they wouldn't necessarily get sanctioned for human rights violations. And the reason that that matters is it's not only symbolic. If somebody is sanctioned for human rights violations, there's a potential for their assets to also be seized and repurposed to rehabilitate victors, victims and survivors of their crimes. So it can serve a real accountability function. And when the people of Iran have seen that a lot of the children of these individuals are driving around in their Bugattis and their flashy cars, it's really an affront to them and the way that they're living. So when we talk about sanctions, let's make sure that we're just distinguishing that there are these targeted human rights sanctions that are strictly on the leadership. All right, well, let's hear from that leadership attending a regional summit in Kazakhstan, Iran's president this Thursday accusing the U.S. of conducting a, quote, failed policy of destabilization against his country. Ibrahim Raisi echoing remarks the previous day by the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who lashed out at the protests. <laughs> Some are either agents of the enemy or if they aren't agents of the enemy, then they are aligned with the enemy. With the same goals, they take to the streets. Others are just excited. The second group can be fixed with cultural works. I don't know, sir, what does he mean by cultural works? <laughs> uh, I suppose uh, he meant about, like, you know, having um, art uh, for them, like, you know, like they, they, several Things to occupy them? Yeah, like several months ago, they, they made a very uh, funny, like, kind of, uh, um, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know how to say this, um, song somehow, like, uh, to, uh, to, oh, mon dieu. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, it's like a uh, like song for 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 the government, like uh, describing them as a as a as a what what a beautiful government that we have, what a beautiful leader leader that we have. These kind of things, and then you know the other artists to like um, propaganda art. Yeah, yeah, kind of that that kind of art, uh, which obviously never works, like uh, because you know people are not stupid. They see they see how they're lying and how hip hypocrite they are. So. Um, yeah, so it's like, I think in this side, he, he meant that about uh, cultural working or like writing like in po poems or, or, or novels <laughs> for the Iranian like uh, regime or something like this. Yeah.
I put the, put them to work writing poems. Yeah. Uh, Mar- Marsa uh, Ali Mardani, uh, we're listening there to an 83 year old supreme uh, leader. Uh, if, uh, as described there by Ida, they're very out of touch. Uh, they nonetheless, uh, is there any way uh, for this to end well? Is there any way for there to be any kind of wiggle room? I mean, um, I mean, these are the questions I guess your colleague is asking from Tehran, where what, what is the end result? I mean, ideally the end result is to seek accountability from uh, this uh, government, this system. Um, you know, I don't think the supreme leader is necessarily out of touch. I think the supreme leader is probably very well informed about what's going on in his country, what's going on with this generation that is revolting against the system that he helms. Um, but I think the desire to hold on pa- to power and the desire for, you know, all the other institutions that benefit from this power and the accumulation of resources um, really does not want to let go or uh, provide any room. Um, you know, there has been a lot of talk about, well, you know, women now in Tehran are walking hijabless uh, past security forces, and, you know, there is that room still. Is but, there you a know, way, Marcia, let me put it to you this way. Instances. Is there a way for the regime to release the pressure valve when it comes to uh, re- restrictions on people's daily lives, on women's rights, uh, while at the same time, keeping political power? Um, I mean, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. It does not seem like they are willing to do that so far from everything we have seen. Um, There would have to be strong deliberations. I mean, um, you know, just following what's happening with technology. They have not yet issued a permanent ban, for example, on certain uh, applications like Instagram and WhatsApp have not had permanent bans because they're still deliberating, you know, the benefits to the economy that having that space open for Iranians brings to the country. And so these are the kind of rationales, I guess, the um, system has to put into place. You know, what are the costs and benefits to potential easing of restrictions um, in order for or, you know, their survival or their economy to continue. So I think these deliberations and thinking will go on. And it's very hard to say where that is right now, because we are still in the midst of uh, large scale brutality, especially this week where we have seen the waves reemerge. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, this is a continuing conversation that I wouldn't have an answer for. Reza Saye, uh, how long can Iran get by with curbs on the Internet? Uh, I mean, they, they see this as a significant threat, so they're going to do it as, as long as it takes. Uh, however, we should point out that the Internet, because it was a quiet day, came back today uh, for a considerable amount of time. So it's not like it's constantly out. The authorities are gauging what's happening out there, the protest. If there's an uptick, they shut it down, they slow it down. And... When there's a decrease in protests, the internet uh, uh, runs again. But you know, I, I think they're going to do what they can, and it's no surprise, uh, you know, un- until uh, things things quiet down. Until things quiet down, uh, Gisunia, you agree with uh, Marsa's uh, view that uh, uh, the regime is not at all out of touch. They perfectly understand what's going on. I think that any repressive dictatorship uh, needs to understand how to silence its population, and it becomes very savvy at doing so. So this isn't about they don't understand what the demands of the people are, and they've just been confused, and now they could just grant it. No, they're very well aware of the disconnect. It's just that their primary aim at this point is to hold on to power and also to profit. So the very important thing is that there's enormous corruption in the country that the leadership benefits from. Um, There's also a black market that has risen up due to the effects of broad-based economic sanctions. And again, it is the leadership that benefits from that. So they're very well aware, and this is about preservation of money and power. Um, There may be a slice of folks that are doing it for pure ideology's sake, 
Um, but that slice gets uh, thinner and thinner. It, it, this is really about preservation of power and, and money. And there, is there a way to release the pressure valve for the regime and hold on to that power? Well, I certainly will not be giving tactical advice to uh, the Islamic Republic leadership on, on how to do that. Um, but, you know, if we were operating in an ideal world, there would be a free and fair election so that the individuals in Iran who are asking for their basic human rights to be respected could have a say in who represents them. I think we understand that um, Khamenei has been there since 1989. He's unelected and accountable to no one. So there really is no way for individuals in the country to be able to um, share their grievances. There's not a free press. Um, there is only a presidential election, which actually resembles more of a selection due to the heavy vetting and the considerations. Um, there aren't a lot of ways for people to you know, basically express their concerns within a representative system. So that's what is going to need to change. Um, there needs to be an end to the discriminatory legal framework and a real change so that individuals in the country can feel that they're being heard. Uh, I don't know, Sarat, when you think back to your high school days, do, could you imagine something like this where you and the other students go out in the street and protest? Actually, the other day I was telling uh, to one of my very closest friends uh, that these kids on the street reminds me reminds me at that time because we were super rebe rebellious. And um, yeah, but what's rebellious in your day? Uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, we we were fed up, but also we had that fear inside us, which transmitted from uh, our family, families who were involved with the, with the revolution. So um, as they said. Uh, you know, they, um, this, this new generation, they don't have that fear like us. So we were like somehow, we, we wanted to like, uh, you know, uh, go against everything that we, we didn't want to have in our lives uh, in that, uh, you know, very closed and uh, uh, repressure atmosphere that we had in Iran. But uh, at the same time, we were super like concerned about my, uh, the security of our families, security of, our, of ourselves. And uh, yeah, we, 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 we were like, uh, you know, kind they're, of... They're, they're young, but they're not stupid. They know the risks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the 16-year-old yeah, exactly. that was that's, killed, the, that's, the, the, the women being, uh, girls being rounded up and yeah. put in psychiatric wards. Yeah, that is the most amazing so part why? of it. Because, you know, they are fed up. Like they, do, they don't have any, any space for, uh, for um, you know, talking, for, for being themselves, for, for any future, imaginable future in that country for them. It's like uh, is economy is collapsing day by after day. It's like, you know, it's, it's super sad, super depressive. The atmosphere inside, inside of Iran, it was uh, already when I, when I left it, but it, it got um, much more worse uh, till that time. So during these six years, I came here by like uh, euro was 4,000 uh, tuman, one euro. Now, uh, now one euro is 35,000 tuman. So can you imagine this like uh, this huge amount of, amount of uh, pressure that they are, uh, they, they don't have anything to lose. I, I, I think that they, they, that's why they are fighting. They're just fighting uh, to regain back their freedom. Nothing to lose. I want to no. leave it there, unfortunately, running out of time. Aida Nasrat, I want to thank you uh, very so welcome. much. Thanks I want to you. thank as well uh, uh, Marsa Ali Mardani for being with us from New York City. Uh, Gisu Ni Marsa Excuse me. Marsa Amiadani uh, from New York City. Thanks. <laughs> Gisu Nia in uh, Los Angeles and France 24 correspondent Reza Saye reporting for us from Tehran. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.